So, so we talked talk there quite a lot about the practice um, of, of people with autism, etc. But now, I'm great to say I'm going to introduce Tree Hall, who is, I don't, can I say openly autistic? Yeah. Does that sound right? And I think one of the key things we said when we spoke yesterday, we said, look, you know, we, don't, we all worry about what words we use. Um, so when you do ask questions later on, don't worry about what words you're using. But Tree, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, firstly, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Secondly, I am now terrified because the bar for presentations this morning has been incredibly high, and following Josh in particular is no easy task. And I'm also standing between you and lunch, so I've got everything <laughs> weighted against me. But let's see where we get to. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is really like to be autistic. You've heard some fantastic scientific conversations. You've heard some really fantastic theories this morning. But what does it mean to be autistic? I am openly autistic. I'm probably ADHD as well. I'm on the waiting list for assessment for that. So maybe in 10 years time, I might finally get assessed and get a diagnosis. That's how bad it is. Um, I'm in a minority, as you will see from the presentation um, and some of the stats that I use, in that I am autistic and I'm in work. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my autistic traits, how autism affects me, how it affects the way that I interact with the world and the way that I see myself in that world. My story is just that. It's my story. There will be some commonalities uh, with other autistic and ADHD people who will experience similar things to me. But all autistic people are different, and I really can't stress that enough. So some of the things that I'll talk to you about a little bit later in terms of ways to help me overcome the challenges I experience in the workplace, they're my solutions. And they will work for some other people, but please don't take them as a blueprint for if I do this, my autistic colleagues will be fine, because they're not. I just want to, I guess, give you a way to think about things in a different context and perhaps to see into my lived experience. And I'm going to keep using those words. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to cover today just a little bit about what autism actually is. What is this autistic spectrum that we talk about? Because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about it, and it's really important that we get that clear. Tell you a little bit about my background. I am late diagnosed autistic, and so much of, of what has been discussed this morning, I'm nodding my head at in terms of experience, and it really resonating with me. We'll look a little bit at autism in the workplace and hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. But if there isn't, I will be here over lunch, so please come and talk to me if you'd like to. So, what is autism? If you look at this slide, you'll see that I've highlighted in red some of the words which are used in, if you just Google autism. Uh, these are the kind of answers that come up. It's a pervasive developmental disorder. Uh, it's characterised by severe deficits. It talks about language dysfunctions, repetitive behaviour, lifelong developmental disability. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not minimising the impact that being autistic has on people, but this is all really negative. Actually, I just have a different operating system. Now, I work in IT, and for me, this is a really powerful way to describe neurodivergent brains. We just have a different operating system. So if you are neuronormative or neurotypical, your brain might work on, say, Microsoft, because that's the most widely accepted system. Mine is probably more like Google, maybe Linux. So it's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. And if you work in IT, you'll know that different systems, different apps, different um, processes require something called an API to help them interact and interface with each other. I need an interface. It's as simple as that. So I'm a different operating system, but not a deficient one. Now, don't worry about trying to read all of this. There's loads of information on the slides, but they'll be circulated afterwards. I just wanted to highlight a few numbers about autism. 75% of individuals referred for an autism assessment wait longer than 13 weeks just to get that first contact. My son waited four years for his diagnosis, 
four years. And when you are in education and you are young and you have ADHD as well, four years without the right supports is immense. My daughter, who is non-binary, was very fortunate in that because of my diagnosis and my sons, they were leapfrogged up the uh, assessment list and managed to get an assessment much more quickly. But my point there is that it is really hard to get an assessment. It is really hard to get that diagnosis. And without that diagnosis, many, many, many supports that would help children in education, adults in the workplace, are not available to you. Autism is prevalent. A lot of us are autistic. There's about 700,000 people in the UK who have a formal autism diagnosis. And that's roughly one in 100. But one in 57 children has an autism diagnosis. Now, autism hasn't suddenly become an epidemic. We're not seeing more people who are autistic. What we're seeing is diagnostic criteria adjusting over time as we understand more about the condition. What this means is that people of my age, and I'm happy to say I'm 48, although I know you'll all think I look an awful lot younger than that, I've uh, lived well, um, people of my age are likely to have missed out on the opportunity for diagnosis. I certainly did. Seven in ten autistic children and young adults said that school would be better if teachers knew and understood more about autism. That is heartbreaking. And as a parent of two autistic children, I can tell you that having to take the local authority to tribunal to get the place that my son needed at school after he'd not been in education for two years was immense. That was an exhausting battle on top of trying to work, support my children, support my husband, and do all of the other things that I needed to do. Boys are three times more likely than girls to receive a diagnosis, and that's because, even though the diagnostic criteria are changing, they are still very much geared towards what's called a typical presentation of autism. Girls fly under the radar. We present differently, and we are missed in terms of diagnosis because of that. So women, people of colour, and also those from socially disadvantaged backgrounds are significantly underdiagnosed. We just don't get the care and support we need, and it's incredibly hard to access diagnosis. So what's the autistic spectrum? Now, I would hazard a guess that if I asked you what the spectrum looked like, most of you would say something like this. Linear, going from not very autistic over here to very autistic over here. It isn't a linear spectrum. And sorry to break it to you, but we're not all on it. You either are autistic or you're not. You can't be a little bit autistic. So what should the spectrum look like? Well, I prefer this. Now, you might not be able to see it very well from the slide, but essentially the spectrum is round. It's a whole different set of traits, of cognitive functions, of processes, and you're not more or less autistic, but my autism profile looks like this. So I have more challenges with cognitive function, for instance. I have more challenges with executive function. I'm extremely sensitive to sensory uh, disturbances and they impact me hugely. I also struggle with social skills. My profile doesn't always look quite like that. It's a spiky profile. It changes depending on the circumstances, depending on how much sleep I've had, depending on what my typical levels of stress or anxiety might be. So some days I'll function better than others. And that, again, is not the same for everyone who is autistic, but is quite common. <coughs> So my story, and I'm, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but just to give you a bit of background, which may resonate for some of you in the room. For most of my life, I felt like a square peg being hammered into a round hole. I've never fit in. And because of that, I've always felt deficient. I felt like a failure. I could not understand how other people could do things with apparent ease that just baffled me. I was an academic high flyer at school. I had a pathological obsession with following the rules. I still do. Breaking a rule is physically painful for me. 
Because of that, I glided through school and all my teachers thought I was thriving. Nobody picked up on the challenges that I had being in school, in the classroom and trying to interact socially. I didn't realise, though, that what I was feeling was because I'm autistic. And it was only when my children started to really show their autistic traits, and in particular my non-binary daughter, who I had to do a lot of research to establish what was going on for them, I started to come across the, the female, if you like, presentation of autism and the different ways that women present their autistic traits. We are fantastic at masking, and that's a word that you heard earlier. I am an incredible mimic. If I see people in social situations, I look at how they are carrying themselves, what they're saying, how they respond to things, and I copy. Because I don't get the cues that you do. Facial expressions, I struggle. I don't know what you mean. I don't understand the unwritten rules of social engagement. So I copy, and I'm really good at it, and people think I'm fine. Getting my autism diagnosis was transformational for me. Um, and actually, the process of getting a diagnosis highlights a lot of my traits. When I started to think that autism might be something that was affecting me, I did an enormous amount of research about it. I did every single online questionnaire that you can do. And they're not diagnostic tools, but they can give you a pretty good indication. And every single test that I completed said, oh yeah, you're autistic. Now, before I went to the GP, I thought, well, I'll just get a bit of a sense check on this and I'll talk to my husband about it. So I did, and I said to him, I think I might be autistic, expecting him to say, mm, no, you've just been reading about it and now you're seeing it everywhere. He literally took a step back and said, well, yeah. <laughs> which knocked me for six a bit, and I said, well, why? Why do you think I'm autistic? And he, without even batting an eyelid, rattled off half a dozen traits, which are absolutely my autism traits. At which point I said to him, but well, why didn't you say something? And it was lovely what he said, but incredibly frustrating at the same time. He said, but it doesn't matter, you're you. You're just you, and I love you for being you, and it doesn't matter whether you have that autism label or not. It's just a label. At which point, I physically shook him because he knows I love a label, and he knows <laughs> that I need that box and I need those definitions because that is how I make sense of the world. So I went to the GP, and I knew I'd have a battle with the GP because referral for diagnosis is a battle for everybody. And the GP said to me, why do you think you might be autistic? At which point I produced from my bag a stack of papers, no joke, that thick, with all my printed out test results, with information about all the different traits that I thought applied to me, and with a written profile that was eight pages long of all the autistic traits that I've identified in myself. She thumbed through it and went, yep, yeah, fine, I'll do a referral now. <laughs> and so I was lucky and I got my referral and it's been life-changing because I look back now on my life and I don't feel like a series of deficits and failures. I just fit differently in the world and I engage differently with the world. But I'm a work in progress, I really am, because I'm trying to peel back all of those years of masking, I'm trying to figure out who I am as an autistic person and what that means for me in the workplace and in the world. And it's a long progress, a long process. And I have experienced burnout on the way. I am still on antidepressants for anxiety and for stress. And it's going to be a long process still for me to really unpick who I am. So what do I want you to know about autism? Well, I mean so much, but I try to distill it down a little bit. Not all autistic people are the same, and you've heard that several times this morning, so I won't keep labouring the point. We aren't all a little bit autistic. We really aren't. The traits of autism can be traits that people who are not autistic have, but the intensity and the level to which those traits impact me and affect my life is way beyond a bit of social discomfort. Some autistic people refer to autism as a superpower, and if that helps them, that is brilliant. 
But the idea of autism as a superpower leaves me cold. It really does. I don't wear a cape. I don't wear my pants over my trousers. I'm not brilliant at maths. I'm okay at computers, but there's a lot of other things about me. And I'm getting my five minute warning and oh, I've still got a lot to go. So I'm gonna gallop now, I'm gonna gallop. Some of my autistic traits then. Strong smells for me, I, will, I, I feel sick. And I pick up smells, I can detect them that other people will go, no, there's nothing, there's nothing there. Yeah, there is, and I've got it, and it's making me feel really nauseous. I stim. I really do stim. For those of you that don't know what stimming is, stimming is repetitive movements designed to soothe and help people cope. My husband now, brilliantly, has learnt to detect the difference between my, my constant leg tapping and what is just, I'm just kind of tapping, and when that tips over into being stressed. It's a subtle difference, I couldn't tell you what it is, but he knows. I am covered in fidget jewellery, I have fidget toys everywhere, and they help me to self-soothe, they help me to feel more relaxed, they help me to manage stressful situations. I have real problems, despite the fact that I'm a CEO, I have real problems with executive function and cognitive function. I cannot organise myself. Uh, I struggle to work out what I need to do for the day. I get totally overwhelmed with my emails. But I also struggle with change, which is a shame because somebody suggested to me eight months ago that I should switch my inbox to... Um, focus rather than just general inbox, which I didn't want to do because it was different. But when I finally did do it, it was transformational and I wished I'd done it eight months ago. <coughs> I can't filter distractions. All of these things hopefully you're seeing from here are all things that impact me in the office. So what does that mean? What does that mean in the workplace? Well, let's focus down a little bit on some of these. I have incredibly rigid thinking. I don't like spontaneity. Um, I struggle with change. But as a CEO in an organisation, change happens and it's thrust upon me. So how do my colleagues deal with it? They know that I need a bit more time to process. They know that I will need a bit of space to get my head around the change, around the implications, and to then come back and be able to cope and to focus on solving whatever the problem is. I struggle in unfamiliar environments. So coming here today, not knowing what the inside of the building looked like, where I was gonna find reception, where I was gonna find the loo, where the auditorium was, that's an additional stressor. And given that most autistic people have a generally higher base level of stress than non-autistic people, you can imagine that my anxiety and stress levels went from here, whereas yours are probably here, to up here. And that's the responses that Josh has been talking about. I struggle with social gatherings. Let me tell you, eye contact is physically painful. It's also exhausting because I don't get it. I don't understand what the right eye contact looks like. So when I'm talking with you and I'm looking you in the eyes, 60% of my brain at least is thinking about, do I blink, do I look away? Am I freaking them out because I'm staring at them? Oh my God, what do I do now? Do I look over their shoulder? Is it all right to look at their eyebrows instead of their eyes? And that doesn't leave a lot of capacity for thinking about what you're actually saying to me and how I need to respond to it. So I guess what I want to get from, the, what I'd like you to take from that is that some of the social norms, some of those things that we think of as, oh, that person is, is social and that person is engaging and that person is listening to me. If I'm not looking you in the eye, you've actually got more of my attention than if I am. So don't make assumptions about people's responses to social situations. I could talk a lot more about this stuff, but you, as I said, you're going to get the slides and I know we're running out of time and my stomach's about to rumble and I'm mic'd up, so that wouldn't be good. So, any questions? And if we don't have time for them now, that's fine. I'll be around over lunch, so come and have a chat with me. I think I've just got one word to sum that one up with. Wow. Um, that was brilliant. To say that you were scared about the high bar, I think you just pole vaulted over it, so that, that was great. Very so good. we do know that lunch is there, and I do need to gallop <laughs> through, but 
I'm sure you've all got burning questions. So who would, whoa, here we go. So Emma, so I'm, your, your steps today are gonna to be so good. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> Hi, my name's Kersin Galia. I'm from the government property agency today. And uh, we design offices. What's the one thing in an office that would improve your office life? Oh, you're not gonna like my answer. No. Um, not being there, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I am firmly in but the when work you from need home. To, when you have to be there. When I have to be, it's knowing that there is somewhere I can go if I need to get away from people and recharge. It's having some quiet space. It's having, knowing that there's that acceptance. And again, Josh used the example of um, headphones. Because I can't concentrate when it's noisy, I need to be able to either put earbuds in or headphones on. Knowing that that is normalised and nobody's going to look at me sideways. So a lot of it is not necessarily about office design. It's about attitudes and cultures in the office. That's what really makes the difference. Thank you. Great question, that one. So any other questions on this one? Hi, thank you so much for that insight, Tree. Um, I'm Ruth Smethurst from the Government Property Agency, and I hope you don't mind if I ask you a little bit of a personal question, actually. Um, a lot of what you said really resonated with me because I've got a sibling who's going through or kicking off the process of being assessed for ADHD themselves. And I just wondered, as an adult, what would you say have been the benefits of having that definitive diagnosis rather than maybe just sort of self-declaring that, that you identify as neurodiverse? Is it essentially what I'm asking you is, is it worth him putting himself through all of the assessments and, and all the tribulations that come with that? that? That's a great question and it's actually a really complex question because so much of it depends on the individual. For me, going all the way through the process with an autism diagnosis and getting that letter that said, you are autistic, I needed that validation and I needed that to be able to say, I need these accommodations. But I've got to be honest, I'm still not great at asking for the accommodations. I think... Because the state of any kind of assessment for autism, for ADHD, for dyslexia, dyspraxia, anything in this country is so appalling, self-diagnosis is valid. It really is valid. And I'm so ragingly angry about the media articles recently about an ADHD epidemic and people using it as an excuse for bad behavior. No, absolutely no, it is not an epidemic. We understand more what ADHD and autism look like, but people can't access the support they need. So I would say, go all the way, get that diagnosis. Yeah, that was good. Thanks so much. PDA to that list as well. <laughs> oh, PDA, well, PDA is a whole different conversation. Yeah. Um, that's a specific profile of autism, and my son is PDA. And let me tell you, that's no fun to deal yeah. with for him or for me. Hi, Trey. I'm Leah, also from the Government Property Agency. We're 8 in 4 today. Are you, are you all here <laughs> today? All, there's nobody, there's nobody working nobody in the, the office. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing so much um, of yourself in that, that presentation. It was fantastic. Um, can you tell us a bit more, because you were just saying about where you prefer to work and like that, the home, but what sort of impact when we're getting, especially within government and within other private companies, that encouragement, enforcement to return to the office, what sort of impact does that have when you've got that neurodiverse profile? I mean, again, that's a great question, very personal response to, to that. So this is my response. You don't take it as red for everybody. It's anxiety because it's change. Now, I'm very fortunate that my charity doesn't have a head office. I am never going to be forced into an office. But if I was in that position, I would feel really worried about the fact that it is going to be different. I will then have to commute. What is that going to look like? What is that going to feel like? When I get to the office, is that environment going to work for me? At home, I don't have to worry about anybody else accepting my quirks and foibles when I'm in my little office at the end of the garden. I have the heater on when I want it on. I have the radio on when I want it on. I turn it off when I want it off. So I think it's that feeling that you've lost control over your environment. And that's why it's so important to have breakout spaces where people can go and regulate or 
shape their environment around them, where they can adjust the heating or the air conditioning, where they can turn sound down or put sound on. Sorry, I can't give you a, a definitive scientific answer to that. No, that's brilliant. That's great. That insight's really useful. Thank you. So we've got one question at the back, and that'll be the last question before we go for lunch. That was an absolutely brilliant presentation, so thank you, Tree. Um, I think for myself, I'm Bali Chase uh, at PwC. So for myself, I'm a self-assessed diagnosed in terms of ADD as well as dyslexia. And I think for myself, hearing the whole aspect around masking, because that's been my coping mechanism throughout my entire life, what type of advice would you be giving to um, lead, like leaders of today in terms of creating a psychologically safe space where people can actually feel that they can actually bring share a part of themselves that might have been very hard for a long time um, that even for themselves have just found that as a weakness and found other ways to try and be part or find this a, a way of trying to belong. Um, I know it's sort of long-winded, but what advice would you have for them so actually they're better, there's a better understanding of who's actually working for them and being able to create th those type of safe spaces? Thank you. Firstly, thank you for sharing your experience and thank you for another great question. I'll try and answer it succinctly. You have to walk the walk. That's the thing. You have to create an environment that fosters um, safety. So be curious. Don't just wait for people to disclose to you that they might have specific needs or need reasonable adjustments. Ask. If you're going into a meeting, ask people, is there anything I can do to make that meeting a bit easier for you? If you've got people coming in for interviews, for, please, please go and check out Ambitious About Autism's website because they've got so much information on there for employers. But do things like send the questions out in advance. Um, tell people who's going to be on the panel and why. It's about providing that information before you're asked for it, I would say. And also, check your responses. If somebody discloses to you that they're autistic or ADHD or anything else, please don't, for the love of everything, say to them, well, I'd never have known, you hide it really well. Because I know that's meant from a positive and supportive place, but actually it reinforces the idea that I have to hide my autism. And it reinforces the idea of masking. Just thank them for sharing. Just tell them that you appreciate that they trust you enough to share and ask them, is there anything that you can do to make the work environment better? But be aware, particularly for those who are late diagnosed like me, that they may not know what they need or what is reasonable to ask for. And they may have an awful lot of internalised ableism. Yep, I'm owning up to that and I'm trying to change it. And they might not think they deserve those accommodations anyway. So it's just, I think, about being kind. It's about being human. And it's about checking your beliefs and stereotypes and seeing people as individuals. Brendan, thank you very much once again. <laughs> thank you.